welcome and a big welcome to the Developing Self Conference and thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview about John Dewey. Um, great. <laughs> well, well, I, as I've told you, I'm not an expert on John Dewey. John Dewey wrote an awful lot and um, he's an interesting character. And one of the things that I found is that um, without knowing something, at least about John Dewey's uh, philosophy and his educational ideas, um, you can't really understand how the Alexander Technique developed. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the technique to a certain extent was hijacked by the doctors who had this sort of quasi medical approach to it. But really, there's this whole other stream, this earlier stream uh, generated by Irene Tasker and Ethel Webb um, on the educational side of things. And it would be nice to be able to sort of give this side of things a boost. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It, that's sort of right at the heart of things for me, that um, educational flag for the work. But... Um, what, what would be lovely to start off with is just who was John Dewey and when was he around? Okay, well, when you mention Dewey, people say, oh yes, the Dewey Decimal System for libraries, and it's nothing to do with that. John Dewey was probably one of America's greatest um, uh, philosophers, and uh, he had a a very long life. He was born in uh, 1859, so he was older than Alexander. 1859, the year that Darwin published his Origin of Species. Mm -hmm. So it was a very different world in 1859. And he lived until, was it 1952? 1952. So you know, he was born just a few years after the um, American Civil War. He lived through two world wars mm -hmm. and he lived into the, into the, the post-industrial age that uh, leads on to where we are today. So his life spans an awful long uh, period. And, and what was he sort of mostly known for as a person? Well, he began as a psychologist. Um, psychology was just becoming um, a separate subject and the new universities in America were setting up departments of psychology. So um, I can't remember where he first got an appointment, but he went to uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, and then from there, he moved to uh, the, the new Chicago University. University of Chicago and he went, he went there as, as a psychologist and one of the things that attracted him was this chance to um, open up what he called the, the, the laboratory school, uh, an experimental school, to uh, try out his, his ideas and his, his thoughts about how education should be organised. That was that was in eighteen ninety six. Mm. And, um, and what so, would you say his um, before we go further into the laboratory school? Um, what would you say his influence on education was, Malcolm? Well, we can't go into the laboratory school really because I don't know terribly much about it but <laughs> he he uh let's say he went there in 1896 the laboratory school i think was set up a couple of years later and then he moved to columbia in new york um in 1904 the same year that alexander moved to london mm. um and what he did was basically revolutionize the whole idea of education. Mm. So I could go into that a little bit. The traditional, uh, the traditional way of teaching uh, goes back to the Greeks, to Aristotle and, and all that, that gang. And there were certain 
things that um, certain ways in which education had developed and was was delivered in Europe. And I think um, America was looking towards um, having its own ideas, not just copying what Europe did, but having its own ideas. Mm. And Emerson was certainly uh, trying in the previous generation was trying to get uh, things different in America. So the first thing was to democratize education. Mm. And Alexander's, um, or rather Dewey's uh, big uh, main work um, in uh, 1916 was called um, Democracy in Education. Mm. So um, what we mean by that is that education was in two parts there were the there was the upper class the toffs they would be educated in in the liberal arts um the liberal arts were mathematics music geometry and one other <laughs> and then there was um the oratory speaking to be able to reason out an argument, to be able to speak eloquently. And um, to, again, there were, there were several aspects to it. Oh, grammar, grammar was the other one. So the, um, the ruling classes were educated in this way. And the rest of us, the workers, learned a skill. They worked with their hands, toiled, by the, their hands and the sweat of their brow. And there was this division within, in education. I mean, me being brought up in the fifties, um, I went through the 11 plus system. And uh, there were those that went off to the grammar school and those like me who went to a secondary school and learned gardening and woodwork and technical drawing. <laughs> Uh, luckily for me, of course, there was music there as well. So uh, it was uh, it was that sort of division in education. Mm -hmm. And Dewey thought, well, um, really, um, human nature isn't fixed. You can't sort of um, divide off human nature like you can divide off the human body into muscles and train muscles to do certain things. Um, you have to uh, devise a way of, of educating people where they can discover what they're good at and encourage them to be themselves, individuals. So uh, that, was, that was one of the things. The other thing was that uh, one should see children as uh, viable in their own right. They weren't just preparing to be little adults. They weren't being moulded into some predetermined uh, role or shape but they were being allowed to develop as individuals and uh, fulfill themselves in their own ways. So it was very different to the sort of uh, rule by, uh, by adults and by authority that the, that the old systems uh, were built on. And <clears throat> when, we, when we've chatted about this a little bit, um, you mentioned that Dewey's wife was also very involved with his ideas and explorations. I think she was. I think she helped an awful lot. Um, Alexander thought a lot of her. She said she was very intelligent. Um, but she's she's in the background, really. Um, she did help with the uh, laboratory school, um, but I don't really have detail of that. The other person was um, Evelyn Dewey, or uh, Dewey's daughter wow. she was very very much much more um to the fore in in education and actually wrote a book the schools of tomorrow with with her father wow. they co-authored a book she was also um active in uh, something called the bureau of educational educational experiments bee in New York. Wow. Um, Jerome Starring has written a very good paper on all that. Um, I suspect that for some reason, e Evelyn 
<coughs> excuse me, Evelyn and um, Alexander didn't get on terribly well, whether she felt that um, Alexander was having too much influence over her father or whether she uh, didn't really approve of, uh, of Alexander coming in and uh, as she would see sort of having his own ideas and mm -hmm. interfering with, with things. But um, I suspect that, that um, Evelyn and Alexander didn't get on particularly well together. So nothing really happened in that area. So, but, but it, as you say, that Alexander and Dewey's wife did get on and, and he thought very highly mm. of her. Mm. And, and Irene Tasker, because in Irene Tasker's paper, that Connecting Links, the talk that she gave in 1968, she talks about traveling across uh, America um, with Mrs. Dewey, well, with both Dewey's, but um, she obviously was, uh, very friendly with with uh, Alice with, with Mrs. Dewey. So that leads me on to ask you when when did actually Alexander meet Dewey, and um, how was Irene Tasker involved in that in that meeting? Well, you can you can read all about this in uh, Michael Block's biography, mm. um, but briefly. Um, it all began when Ethel Webb, who had read the first edition of, of Manson Supreme Inheritance in 1910, she decided she wanted to go over to Rome and uh, join the first um, uh, conference that uh, Maria Montessori was holding. So that was in 1912. And she took with her the, the little subsequent uh, booklet called Conscious Control with her and uh, while she was in Rome she met um, some other girls. Um, she met some Americans, uh, one of whom was um, Margaret Naumberg mm -hmm. and she met Irene Tasker and after the conference um, they'd obviously realized that there was a lot in common between Alexander's ideas and uh, Dewey's ideas. Uh, Namberg knew the Deweys. She'd uh, roomed, I think, at university with um, Evelyn Dewey with the daughter. And um, Irene Tasker had, had read uh, William James's book, Talks to Teachers. We could talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. But um, they decided that um, the, the two uh, women, um, that was Tasker and um, Naumberg to come to London and have lessons with Alexander. Wow. And Naumberg went back to America and set up her own school, which became the Walden School in New York. And uh, Irene Tasker, as we know, sort of became a lifelong uh, assistant and uh, friend of, of Alexander's and uh, went with him, uh, worked in, in, uh, in America during the war, during the war years, um, when Alexander went over there first in, in 1914. And, and, and from there, he went, was it in 1916 that um, Ephraim and Dewey met, actually? Uh, so the books say, they say the winter of 19, 1915, 1916, that they actually met. So the first time he went over, um, 1415, um, he didn't meet them. He just worked um, with um, Margaret Naumberg's um, friends. And then the following year, 1516, he met Dewey um, at, a, at, in a at a dinner, the Bushes, I think it was, um, were giving a dinner and he met he met Dewey but it wasn't until the following year um, 1917 when he actually started having lessons and I got a letter from Alexander to to Alexander's wife um, and he says uh, I've just given some lessons to Mrs Dewey um, very important for the work I'll tell you later um, so that was in March 1917 so 
um, John Dewey would have started his lessons pretty soon after that. Time. Really interesting. And so, um, how did you, how do you sort of see them getting on, and why did they get on? You know, what was what was sort of sort of the chemistry there between the two of them? Well, they were a bit of an odd couple, really. Um, <clears throat> you know, you've got Dewey, who by by then was um, one of the America's top top academics <clears throat> in one of the top universities. And you've got this um, rather eccentric um, teacher uh, from London who uh, wasn't a joiner in her. And as he said himself, he was an outsider. So they were very, very different um, in, in their circumstances. But um, what I think, and you can see this from the pictures of them both, you know, they had a they had a jolly time together. They look, they look really as though they they enjoy each other's company, and there's there's several accounts of how they spent long conversations into the night talking about this and that. So I think um, the both coming from a kind of pioneering stock. Um, Dewey was from Vermont, from a, a rural background, and of course Alexander was from a rural background in Tasmania. So I think, you know, they could, uh, they only had to go a generation back and, and they were in farming country. So they had that as a, as, a, um, as a background. The other thing I think is that Dewey, uh, by all accounts, rather liked um, weird people. He liked, he was a little bit like, um, you know, the government likes to have people that think outside the box uh, to give them new ideas. You know the the the, the Cummings equivalent um, for the for okay. Boris's government, wow. and uh, I think that um, Dewey um, cultivated um, relationships with with people who were a little bit different, who thought in different ways. Mm. So uh, I think he was intrigued by uh, by what Alexander had to offer, but they you know they stayed they stayed friends. Really, I mean, most people fell out with Alexander sooner or later, but <laughs> <laughs> they seem to they seem to stay friends for, for the rest of Dewey's life for another thirty six years. Fantastic, and and what would you say, Alexander, as that slight outsider, the, the, the person who thought out of the box? What did he have to offer to Dewey, who already you know had a considerable um, you know, over of books and ideas, and, and what and what what an amazing man mm. must have been to open up to Alexander's thoughts. But what what did Alexander offer him there? Well, Dewey was a thinker. He was somebody who sat and wrote. And if you read his books, they're even more tedious than Alexander's. <laughs> they have sentences with clauses and subclauses explaining precisely what what he's trying to think um and so when he met when he met alexander and he he is mentioned obliquely in um constructive conscious control alexander talks about an author who was um in pretty poor way and he's he means dewey at the end of writing um his uh, his education and democracy or democracy and education book um he was pretty exhausted physically and mentally and a bit of a wreck mm. so when he started having lessons with uh, with alexander it was a revelation to him that you could use your brain for other things rather than this rather deep mental thinking that you could think about yourself and you can think about how you used yourself and how how you moved so um i think one of the things was that it gave um as it give, give, gives us as well um a sense of um body mind unity this this sense that uh, it's not just a mind inside a body that's uh, that's ticking over and that you can use the use the mind to um, 
to monitor and uh, be conscious of bodily as well um, in constructive conscious control Alexander starts to use this phrase doesn't he what does he, he says learning and learning to do mm. so the learning is the is the learning the facts and the figures the thinking work but learning to do like thinking in activity is is another way of using using the brain in a practical way really ooh, really interesting because it must have um must have sort of uh given that um given dewey not just a chance to improve his health but to understand how to sort of transcend psychophysical habit um, mm. which is yeah i guess what we're all after <laughs> and the other the other big thing i think let me just what does he say? Um, one of his um, introductions to Alexander's books, he says um, that uh, he he was it was demonstrated to him the unconditional necessity of inhibition of customary acts. Ah. So the idea that unless you can stop the immediate reaction, mm. you're never going to get anything different. Mm. And, that, and that inhibition is the, uh, the basis to, to, to education. And, and that fits in very nicely with the idea that instead of the authority being imposed on you from outside by adults, telling you what you should learn and what you should do, that you should be engaged in activities that interest you mm. and that are going to be relevant to you in your daily life okay. so that the interest creates uh, a self-discipline and um, uh, inhibition uh, process rather than, um, as I say, being something that is, is external to you. If you're interested in doing something, you you really do uh, try to work out how to how to do things, and you have to learn how to how to control yourself and how to be disciplined. So inhibition becomes something absolutely crucial to uh, yeah. how you how you think and how you develop yourself. Which which even today sounds quite modern in terms of thinking about what's going on in many schools. It's mm -hmm. really fascinating. And um, so that leads us on to thinking, what did Dewey offer Alexander as a, as a person and, and as, as a sort of thinker, really? What, did, mm. what was offered there? Well, <laughs> if you read <laughs> quite a lot, I've, I've written a paper about this in, um, I think it's in journal number 26. I was looking at it the other day. I could do it better now, but it was a it was <laughs> it was a stab stab at doing it. But you know, because we know we know that um, Dewey was was influenced a lot by Alexander, both from what Dewey writes himself in the introductions to the books, and from Eric McCormack's thesis on the influence of of Alexander on Dewey. But we don't know much about the other way around. And uh, most people say that Alexander wasn't influenced by anybody. He was too much interested in what he was interested in and <laughs> only interested in other people, so long as it corroborated what he did and what he thought. But uh, if you look at uh, the way his books develop, and particularly between the 1918 Man Supreme Inheritance and then Constructive Conscious Control, there is a big shift in emphasis um from instinct and uh, evolution through to more education and and process and it's difficult to to say you'll have to ask me again in six months i'm thinking about it but i think i think dewey gave alexander another way of thinking other than the sort of old 19th century uh, metaphysical way of of thinking about things. He, 
in Man's Supreme Inheritance, he talks a lot about sort of man's, man's aspiring consciousness and things like that. There's um, Dewey sort of earths, uh, <laughs> brings him down to earth and uh, makes, makes it much more um, as, a, as a biological process of, of development, child development. A lot more was known uh, later about how we, how we develop cognitively and, and uh, physically. Certainly for when the, the little school was set up um, with Tasker and then later Goldie. Um, Goldie was Froebel based, wasn't she? And, yeah. uh, and uh, Tasker was, uh, I suppose, Montessori uh, based. So, um, they really got on with things, and I think Alexander um, was developing his hands-on work and, and how to put things across. Mm. I think it's incredible, really, now, when you think that the work is in so many performing arts institutes and beginning to be more in schools and, and universities. You know, just fantastic to hear how Alexander really, I think it's sort of like Dewey sort of made that, that context really valuable and, and, and sort of understandable for people. And really when you think about how, you know, Barlow's work uh, then went on to contextualize it in a music college, it, it all seems to make sense, doesn't it? From, from having had Dewey's sort of rubber stamp, I suppose, on, on the mm. whole thing. It's a, he's, yes, he's, he's certainly a, a, a good badge of honour to have, have a, have a Dewey stamp of, of approval. Um, that sure. but, and, and he's very in at the moment, because um, it's like, like most people, you know, they go in and out of fashion, but, but Dewey is, is very in. And you, was, you were saying that, um, I should mention that, that conference in 2016 in, at Cambridge, yes. that was celebrating the, uh, the centri centenary of his, uh, his landmark book, uh, Democracy and Education. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't tell you much about the, the conference except uh, the food was fantastic and the whole place, <laughs> <laughs> the whole place was just wonderful. And it was full of people, educationists from all over the world. And we had a, um, there was myself, uh, Charlotte Woods and Jenny Fox Eads, the three of us um, went and they set up a special place for us to give turns to people in breaks. And uh, we, gave, we gave a talk. They were really interested. Most of them had never heard of Alexander. They were, yeah. but they were, fa they were fascinated to, to know that Dewey had uh, had this other, <laughs> other unknown side to, to him and the influence. So it was a, it was a great experience. Um, so we do need to, um, I think, really push the um, this side of things, um, this this educational. Um, That's so true, aspect. because so many people feel um, that Dewey championed their work from sort of taxi drivers to librarians to and just about anybody. Uh, he, he's a marvellous champion to have mm -hmm. had um, in your world. So mm -hmm. um, Malcolm, how do you see Alexander's work in terms of education and what it has to offer, particularly today, I suppose, is, is my mm. question. Well, let me go back just a little bit, um, because Dewey's idea of education couldn't, couldn't have been what it was without the work that had been done, been done beforehand by uh, William James. Mm. And William James, again, I think, was a big influence on Alexander. Um, his, his medical friends, um, Skane Spicer in London, 
they were great friends to begin with. They, they had this almighty bus stop over plagiarism, <laughs> but uh, but before that, they they were great friends. And I think um, Alexander was pointed in William James's direction, and the whole theory of of, um, of habit, and that habits are developed um, and have to be acted upon. So when you have a a desirable habit, a, a desirable thought, let's say you know you you think of giving uh, a coin to the uh, to the to the beggar in the street. It's no good having the nice thought. You've actually got to act on it. <clears throat> and this was crucial to uh, um, Dewey's idea of learning by doing, mm. that you, you, learn how, you learn how to do good deeds, as it were, and uh, by repeating them, hopefully they become good habits and you become a good person and a good citizen and, uh, and all the rest of it. So that's, you know, that's one of the, the aspects, I think, to, to how um, education um, is organized when you think of uh, Dewey. And um, I think probably if I just read you something from uh, one of the books on Dewey, talking about how it's going to help in the future, uh, better than any age in the history of mankind, we are able to see the wonderful malleability, the infinite plasticity of human nature. Just as modern technology has created a new industrial potential, so democracy stands for a new human potential. And just as we may choose to use new technology in old ways for personal gain or to create or to create new applications for the widest public welfare, so democracy and education can help access new human capacities that can be applied intelligently, either for uh, selfish reasons or for the common good. Yes. And uh, I think that you know that that's what we what we're aiming for. I think with education creating. Uh, good, good members of society, uh, good individuals, well, well, uh, well developed individuals who are good members of society, and are working to the common good of the world. Yes. Uh, with all all this um, uh, climate change and everything else, it's Absolutely. really. And I love that welfare was included and in the sense that it's hard for us all to make good choices if we're not healthy and if we don't, if we're not able to be in charge of ourselves. I, I love the way that's included there. Very and it's all, it's all based on self-fulfillment. Mm, very interesting. So um, I think he was a good egg, really. And uh, we need the Alexander technique as the means whereby <laughs> for putting for putting these these uh, grand ideas into practice. Yes, and and hopefully saving saving the planet as well as ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Well, that's right. If you um, you know that was the of the individual, wasn't it? That. Um, um, Alexander said that was the most important bit of the uh, the title of his book mm. and by having fulfilled uh, thinking individuals mm. you have a, a creative um, society and uh, I, I also love about Dewey was that he you know the way he mentioned that Alexander helped him to hold a thought and open his mind to other people's thoughts respectfully. And, and I think that's something that's mm -hmm. underestimated. That's right, yes. It, you know, it, it goes right to the point, really, that it, although he, 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 he talks about uh, the enormous physical benefits he got from the lessons, 
mm. he says that the the most important thing for him was that it could help him to um, defend his ideas but if new information came along that he could change he could realize that what he thought was the truth mm. was uh, was in fact uh, delusion um, I've not read the book yet, The, the Quest for Certainty, mm. but uh, he wrote that, um, well, it was the Gifford Lectures, and on his way up to Edinburgh to give those lectures, he was having Alexander lessons with Alexander in, in London. Wow. So um, um, uh, Alex Murray's told me I have to read uh, The Quest for Certainty. Alex is a great authority on the whole thing. So. Yeah, marvellous. And um, well, I think that's a lovely place to conclude and, and hope that a few world leaders and a few educationalists might <laughs> <laughs> take up the cause of the Alexander Technique. Thank you so much, Malcolm. That was just fascinating. Really Good. Cool. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.